Griffin, it's time to play. What? Welcome to another episode of Duel of the Peaks. I am your host, Peter, joined by Landon. Hey guys, Landon here. And we are excited to bring you the second episode of our second season of Duel of the Peaks. Before we get started, a quick shout out to our sponsors. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video and all of the videos on our channel. If you click on the link in the description, it will take you to their website and you can buy board games, card games, any kind of magic card that you see in this video. And going through that link supports the channel. So check them out. And if you want to support us directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash command valley and sign up today for some sweet perks play games with us over Discord, and get some sweet merch in the mail. All right, with our sponsors out of the way, just a quick introduction to this video. We are playing the same commanders that we played in our previous video, and roughly the same builds with a couple of cards swapped in and out. Uh, the only thing that we couldn't change is our commanders. So we're playing with the same commanders, a game two, and we are still just using cards from Call Time. And with that, let's go to our deck introductions, starting with Landon. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. Now I will be going over the opening hands and the turn order for this video. Going first in turn order today is Caleb, and I will allow him to introduce his opening hand and his deck. Hey guys, this is Caleb. I am playing Asika, God of the Tree, for this game, and I haven't changed my deck a whole lot from the last game. The only thing that I've done is I've replaced In Search of Greatness with Glimpse the Cosmos. I had In Search of Greatness in my hand for a lot of the last game, and I realized that it's really not that great of a card, so I put in Glimpse the Cosmos for some extra card draw. My opening hand contained Dark Boar Pathway, Snow-Covered Plains, Snow-Covered Swamp, Snow-Covered Mountain, Alrund, God of the Cosmos, Battle of Frost and Fire, and Binding the Old Gods. Hello everybody, here's Griffin, episode 2, still playing Vega the Watcher. I didn't make any cuts or changes to this deck since the color pair that I chose doesn't have a lot of options so far. But that's okay, I won the first game, so how hard can it be? My opening hand was a Plains, a Hengegate Pathway, Resplendent Marshal, Search for Glory, Replicating Ring, a Beskir Shieldmate, and Cosima, God of the Voyage. And my opening hand consisted of a Dream Devourer, a Doomscar, an Infernal Pet, a Battleshield Warrior, Great Hall of Starnheim, Snow-Covered Plains, and a Normal Plains. And last in turn order, I am playing Jorn, God of Winter, again. And I traded a couple of cards out for some more flying support because the last game I kind of got screwed over by the lack of flying in my deck. So I got some things to deal with flying and to have more flying presence on my board. And my opening hand consists of Crippling Fear, Kozuma, God of the Voyage, Draugr's Helm, Raise the Draugr, Port of Carfell, Skemfar, Elder Hall, and a Snow-Covered Island. And with our opening hands revealed, let's begin the game. Like I said earlier, Caleb is starting us off in turn order, and he untaps and draws and plays on a tap, Shimmer of Drift, Veil, choosing green as it enters, and he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays on a Hennegate Pathway as his land for turn, and then ships the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays on a Great Hull of Starnheim, which enters a battlefield tapped and passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays on Port of Carfell and passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a tap Sulphurus Meyer and then ships the turn over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and taps both of his lands to foretell a card and with nothing left he gives the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a snow covered plains and taps two mana to cast his dream devourer and then he ships the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down Skemfar Elder Hall as his land for turn and ships the turn to Caleb. Very different turn two from our first game. We don't see a lot of foretelling, but we do see a lot of setup for uh, more mana versatility and more lands that do something on the battlefield. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a Slitherbore pathway and then taps three mana to cast his commander Essica. He then ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island and then pays 3 mana to cast a Replicating Ring. 
Turn three ring in this meta, good. <laughs> Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing and plays down a planes as his land for turn and pays three mana to cast an infernal pet and with nothing left ships the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a snow covered island and pays three mana for a glittering frost enchanting the skimfart elder hole turning it into a snow land and letting it tap for more mana. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing and pays two mana for a path to the world tree and when it ETBs he will search his library for an island and put it into his hand. He then plays that island and taps two mana for Haka Whispering Raven. He then heads into combat, swinging Essica at Griffin for a total of one damage and with nothing left he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and then draws for his turn. Plays down an island and then taps two for a clarion spirit and then taps three more to cast Vega. This will trigger his clarion spirit seeing the second spell cast in a turn and he will get a 1-1 spirit. With nothing left he sends the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a batter shield warrior and heads to combat swinging at Peter with his infernal pet for a total of 2 damage which Peter takes going down to 38. Peter untaps and draws and plays on the Litjara Mirror Lake. He then taps for four and uses three of it, floating one, to cast Yorn. He uses that one floating to cast a Frost Augur. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing and plays on a snow-covered plains as his land for turn and pays three mana to cast a glittering frost of his own on his own island. He then heads to combat, swinging Haka in the air at Landon for two and Landon takes it going down to 38. Haka then returns to Caleb's hand and he scries two to the bottom with its ability. He then pays two mana to recast Haka from his hand and then ends his turn. Haka is a really valuable card on Caleb's board, not only being a legendary creature and counting more towards his theme, but it's also giving him that early game card advantage, uh, selecting the cards that he wants to be on top of the library and kind of looking for things that will help him in the game right now rather than way on in the future and then later with haka returning to his hand he'll probably cast all run with a huge hand and a lot of power on the board griffin untaps and puts another counter on his replicating ring in his upkeep and then draws his card for turn and taps two mana for a glimpse the cosmos getting one off the top and the other three go to the bottom of his library he then plays an island as his land for turn and pays 4 mana for an axe guard braggart. This will trigger his clarion spirit seeing his second spell cast in a turn, creating a 1-1 spirit token. He heads to combat, swinging Vega at Peter in the air for 2 damage and Peter with no flying blockers goes down to 36. And with nothing left, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a plains as his land for turn and pays 2 mana to 4 telecard from his hand. He then heads to combat, swinging as much as he can at Caleb, and in response to attacks, boasts his battle shield warrior, pumping his entire team by plus one plus one. Caleb blocks the Dream Devourer with Essica and takes a total of six damage, dropping him down to 34 life. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and pays three mana for a Cosima, God of the Voyage. He then plays down a tapped ice tunnel as his land for turn. He then activates his Frost Augur, revealing a snow-covered island from the top of his library, and since it is a snow permanent, he can put it into his hand. He then heads to combat and swings his commander Yorn at Landon, which will trigger and untap all of his snow permanents. Landon has no blockers, and he takes it going down to 35. With nothing left, Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a swamp as his land for turn and heads to combat and swings Essica and Haka both at Landon and Landon has no blocker so he takes it going down to 32. This will trigger Haka and he taps it in response with Essica so he can make some mana from it and then the trigger resolves bouncing Haka back to his hand. He then scries two and puts them both on the bottom of his library. Before combat ends, he activates path to the world tree and he gains two life and Griffin will lose two life. He also gets to draw two cards, make a 2-2 bear, and he deals the two damage from the world tree to Vega. In his second main phase, he pays two more mana to cast Haka from his hand, and with nothing left, passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays on a glacial floodplain as his land for turn, and heads to combat, swinging the axe card Braggart at Caleb for three damage. Caleb takes it going down to 33. In Griffin's second main phase, he recasts his commander Vega from the command zone, and with nothing left, passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and casts a Beskir Shieldmate, and in his end step, Peter activates Frost Augur, revealing a snow-covered forest off the top of his library and he gets to put it into his hand. With no further actions, Landon's turn ends, and Peter begins his turn by untapping, and in his upkeep, Cosima will trigger and he sends it into exile. He then draws and plays down a snow-covered island as his land for turn, which will trigger his exiled Cosima and it will get a voyage counter. 
He then pays 2 mana to cast a Draugr's Helm, and he pays 4 mana to equip it onto his commander, Yorn. He then pays 1 more mana to activate his Frost Augur again, getting a Snow-Covered Island off the top of his library. He heads to combat, swinging Yorn at Caleb for 5, and on attack, his commander triggers, untapping all of his Snow Permanents. He then activates Frost Augur again, getting a Rhymewood Falls from the top of his library into his hand. With a very value-packed turn, he passes back to Caleb. Yeah, I have to agree there. The fact that he pulled four lands off the top with his Frost Augur over the last two turns for a total of four mana, that's a really powerful effect to be able to tap and untap that twice per turn, essentially, and get a whole bunch of value off of the top. Dig deeper, get those snow lands out of the library, and make sure that he has those land drops that he can play. Caleb untaps and draws and plays on a snow-covered mountain as his land for turn and heads right into combat. He swings Haka and a bear at Peter for 4 damage total. Peter takes it going down to 32 and the damage will trigger Haka returning it to his hand and he scries 2 cards to the bottom of his library. I wonder what Caleb has been looking for. I mean, he's every single time has scried both cards to the bottom. Well, I don't know. He's, he's not missing his land drops. He must be just seeing lands off the Yeah, top. He, this is true. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. moving them to the bottom, yeah. In his second main phase, he taps 5 mana for the Saga Battle of Frost and Fire, which will deal 4 damage to each non-giant creature. With that on the stack, he taps 1 mana for a Village Rites to sacrifice his bear token and to draw 2 cards. And when Landon's best gear shieldmate dies from the Battle of Frost and Fire, he will get a 1-1 Soldier token. With that resolved, he then uses the rest of his mana for an Ice Hide Troll, and with nothing left to do, Caleb passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and in his upkeep puts a fourth counter on his replicating ring and draws his card for turn. He plays on a planes and then taps seven mana to cast a Valkyrie's sword, which will make an angel and the sword will be attached to it. With nothing left to do, he goes to end his turn and in response, Landon casts a village rites in his end step to sacrifice the 1-1 soldier token to draw two cards. With no further actions, Landon begins his turn. He untaps and draws and plays down a planes as his land for turn and pays two mana to foretell a card. He then pays 3 mana to cast the Saga Ascent of the Worthy with nothing to target with its first and second ability. With nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down the Rhymewood Falls that the Frost Augur gave him last turn, which will trigger Cosima and it will return to the battlefield and since it had one voyage counter on it, Peter will get to draw a card. He then pays 2 mana and he foretells a card from his hand and pays 2 mana for a Weathered Runestone. This is definitely one of the most feared cards at the table, one of the stacks pieces that's in the set. It totally hoses Caleb's Prismatic Bridge, which is the reason that Peter cast it at this point, was because Essica was back in the command zone, and he didn't want him to cast Prismatic Bridge and get all of that value again. So that was kind of a deterrent there. And it also affects any reanimator strategy or anything like that. So it's a really powerful effect to have on the board. Peter heads to combat, swinging his commander Yorn at Griffin for five. And on attack, his commander triggers, untapping all of his snow permanents. Griffin declares no blockers, takes five, and goes down to 32. With nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, and after he draws, the Battle of Frost and Fire triggers, and he gets to scry two to the bottom and keeps one on top. Must have found what he was looking for. <laughs> yeah, finally, after scrying seven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> over throughout the game. Oh, man. Right. I'm glad you found it, Caleb. Caleb then pays three mana to cast a replicating ring of his own, and then taps six mana to cast the other side of Haka, Alrund, God of the Cosmos, who is currently a 7-7. He then goes to his end step and Allrend will trigger and he names creatures and gets Torolf and Jarl of the Forsaken off the top of his library. He then has to discard some cards in his cleanup step, but with nothing left to do, he ships the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and in his upkeep puts another counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He then plays down a Shimmerdrift Veil, naming blue as it enters, and heads to combat, swinging his angel at Peter for 6, who has to take it going down to 26. He then taps 7 mana to cast his commander again from the command zone, and with nothing left to do, passes the turn to Landon. This is exactly what I was talking about with the flying support, just getting pummeled by Griffin with his flying angels. It doesn't feel good to be on Peter's board right now. Landon begins his turn, he untaps and draws, and he has nothing to target with the Ascent of the Worthy. 
He then pays two mana and exiles a card from his graveyard to cast Stalwart Valkyrie at a reduced price. And in his end step, Peter casts a Feed the Serpent to exile Griffin's Angel Warrior that keeps smacking him in the face. And with no further effects, Peter begins his turn. He untaps and in his upkeep, exiles Cosima from his side of the board, and then he draws his card for turn. He plays on a snow-covered forest as his land for turn, and that will put a Voyage counter on Cosima. He then taps 2 for a glimpse of the cosmos, getting a card off the top of his library and the rest go on the bottom. He then taps 2 for a strategic planning, putting one card from his hand from the top 3 and then the other 2 go into his graveyard. He then taps 2 mana for a pilfering hawk and then heads to combat, swinging Yorn at Griffin and untaps all of his snow permanents and Griffin goes down to 27. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Caleb. It's clear here that Peter is digging for something. You can see he casts uh, 2 kind of cantrips on his turn and a pilfering hawk so he's he, even though he has that yorn that survived the board wipe and the weathered runestone he's uh running out of gas in his hand caleb begins his turn and untaps and in his upkeep gets one counter on his replicating ring he then draws and his battle of frost and fire will trigger its final lore counter letting him draw two cards and discard a card for every time he casts a spell with cmc5 or greater for the rest of the turn he then pays 7 mana to cast Tybalt Cosmic Imposter, which will trigger the Frost and Fire. He draws 2 and discards 1, and when Tybalt enters a battlefield, he is going to get an Emblem. He then activates Tybalt's plus 2 ability, exiling the top card of each of his opponent's library, getting a Doomscar, a Snow-Covered Forest, and a Vengeful Reaper, and Tybalt will let him cast those spells. He then, in his end step, triggers All Run, and he gets Inga Rune Eyes off the top, and Rise of the Dreadmarn will go on the bottom. And with no further effects, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and in his upkeep puts a 6 counter on his replicating ring and then he draws his card for turn. He pays 2 mana to foretell a card and pays 3 mana to attach the Valkyrie's sword to his commander, Vega. He then pays 2 mana for a sword of the realms and also equips that to Vega. Watch out, <laughs> the bird has two swords. Oh my gosh, dual wielding owl. <laughs> He then heads to combat, swinging for 6 damage at Tybalt, and with no blockers, Tybalt takes it. And with nothing left, passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and the Ascent of the Worthy triggers, but Weathered Runestone prevents him from returning anything from his graveyard to the battlefield. That's a feel bad. That saga did absolutely nothing. Yeah, no, it really did do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he then pays 2 mana for a youthful Valkyrie, and he heads to combat and swings his stalwart Valkyrie at Tybalt to finish off the Planeswalker. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Peter. Thank goodness that Tybalt is gone. It was a threat on the board ever since it exiled that Doom Scar from the top. Unfortunately, Caleb can still cast those cards because the emblem is what lets him do that, not Tybalt himself. So we've got that Doom Scar looming over our heads now. Peter begins his turn by untapping and drawing and pays one mana to activate his pilfering hawk to draw a card and discard an island. He then plays a snow covered swamp which triggers Cosima and he will return her from exile to the battlefield to draw a card. He then heads to combat and swings Yorn at Landon this time and with his trigger on the stack Landon casts a foretold poison the cup to kill Yorn and he scries two cards from the top of his library to the bottom. The trigger now resolves and all of his snow permanents will untap. He then activates his pilfering hawk again. He draws a card and discards a forest. He then pays four mana for a Draugr Necromancer and pays five mana to recast his commander, Yorn. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb begins his turn by untapping and drawing and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring. He then plays down a Tyrite Sanctum as his land for turn and he then swings all around at Landon who is a massive AA and a Ice Hide Troll at Griffin. Landon blocks the all around with a youthful Valkyrie which will die but instead of dying it's going to be exiled with an ice counter because of the Draugr Necromancer. Griffin chooses not to block but before damage Caleb pumps the Ice Hide Troll once more to deal a total of 4 damage to Griffin and giving the troll indestructible. Griffin will go down to 23 as a result. In his second main phase, Caleb pays 4 mana to cast Torolf and pays 4 mana for a Kolvori. And in Caleb's end step, Allrend will trigger and he names creatures and he gets a Glorious Protector off the top of his library and an island will be put on the bottom. Griffin begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep puts a 7th counter on the replicating ring and then he draws his card for turn. He then casts Allrend's Epiphany from Fortel, making 2 1 1 birds and Vega will draw him a card and he gets to take an extra turn. He then heads the combat and swings Vega at Caleb for 6 damage, bringing Caleb down to 22. He then pays 2 mana to foretell a card and passes to his second turn. 
He untaps and in his upkeep puts an 8th counter on his replicating ring and removes all of the counters and makes 8 replicated rings. That was a really smart move on Griffin's part. That eliminates the possibility of someone holding up interaction just to deal with the replicating ring to the last moment. He just bypassed that turn and he, he got it anyways. So very smart play. And then he draws and plays on an island as his land for turn. He then goes to combat, swinging two birds and his Swole Vega at Caleb, who has no blocks. Griffin responds to no blocks by casting Kaya's Onslaught from Fortel, which will also draw him a card from Vega's ability. This will also pump Vega and give it double strike, so it will be doing a total of 14 damage, which is just one shy of just enough commander damage to take Caleb out. With no blocks, Caleb goes down to 6 life. Griffin then puts 15 mana into Starnheim Unleashed from Fortel, which makes 7 4 4 angel tokens. This will also trigger Vega, drawing Griffin a card. And with nothing left to do after this massive haymaker of a turn, he ships the turn to Landon. Yeah, you can see here that Griffin was trying to take out Caleb pretty seriously, but he just fell short. Yeah only ending up with 20 commander damage marked on Caleb instead of the required 21. So he was very, very close. Uh, but to give him that extra bit of insurance, he just pumped all of his mana into a bunch of 4-4 four, four angels, which are really, really hard to deal with with this table unless we see another board wipe or that doom scar that, uh, that Caleb's holding over our heads. Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing and plays on a snow-covered swamp and passes. Peter untaps and in his upkeep, Exiles Cosima from his board and draws his card for turn. He activates his Pilfering Hawk, drawing a card and discarding a card, and pays three mana for a replicating ring of his own. And so help me if this game goes on eight more turns for Peter to get eight rings, I'm going to go insane. <laughs> <laughs> He then pays 4 mana to attach the Draugr Helm to his commander, Yorn, and then he heads to combat, swinging Yorn and Draugr Necromancer at Landon. All of his snow permanents will untap per Yorn's trigger, and Landon will take the 9 damage going down to 23. Peter then pays 2 mana to cast a Youthful Valkyrie from Exile with the Draugr Necromancer's ability. He activates Pilfering Hawk again, discarding a snow-covered forest and drawing a card. With nothing left to do, we pass the turn into the deep dark oblivion where we don't do anything because we went home. <laughs> yeah, at this point, we were running into some technical issues and we d decided to transition this game to recording from home. So if you see a dip in quality, that's exactly why. It's because we change cameras and everything and we're recording over Discord. Kayla begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep gets a counter on his replicating ring and then he draws his card for turn. Pays 4 mana to activate and sacrifice the Tyrite Sanctum, giving Allround an indestructible counter. He then pays 5 mana to cast that pesky Doomscar from Exile. Griffin responds to this cast by paying 2 to cast a Disdainful Stroke to counter the Doomscar. Thank goodness. He then heads to combat, swinging everything that he can at Griffin in revenge for a total of 22 damage. Landon responds to the attacks by casting a Phoebus Serpent targeting Vega, so it is exiled and it goes back to the command zone. Griffin blocks all around with an angel and takes the rest, going down to 10. Caleb then passes and in his end step, Alrun triggers and he chooses instance and gets nothing off the top and going to discard, discards a blood on the snow. With no further actions, Griffin untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He taps 8 of his rings and equips the Valkyrie sword to one of his birds and a sword of the realms to the other. He then casts Raven's Warning for 3, making another bird and gains 2 life, bringing him up to 12. He then goes to combat, swinging 6 angels and 2 of his birds at Landon. Landon blocks the bird with the sword of the realms and takes the rest, knocking him out of the game. Rip in peace, Landon. Rip in peace, Landon. Uh, it looks like you were really suffering from the mana, not being able to get your, your commander out, as well as just not really having a lot of gas yeah. uh, to do much on that game. Also, the weathered runestone was impacting your board and the board wipes and it you just didn't have the gas and also my deck was just really bad um i played out my whole hand and i, I kept a really slow opening hand i didn't really have any acceleration from the beginning yeah and the board wipes just i i wasn't able to ever draw more than one card in a turn and so I, there just wasn't much i could do to crawl back into this game so i was totally fine being wiped out so what happens when you play a bad deck Griffin then taps 5 mana for a Reflections of Lyara naming Birds. He then casts an Augury Raven, 
which will trigger the reflection of Yara and he will make a second copy of the Augury Raven. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and draws his card for turn. He plays down a snow-covered island which will trigger Cosima, he will return it from exile and when it ETBs he will draw a card. He activates his pilfering hawk, drawing and discarding a snow-covered swamp and pays 6 mana for a burning rune demon. When it enters a battlefield he researches library for a saw it coming and a rise of the dreadmarn and he lets Caleb choose which one will go to his hand and which one will go to the graveyard. Caleb puts the Rise of the Dreadmarn into the graveyard, and Peter gets the Sot coming into his hand. Probably a good indication that Caleb is going to try to board wipe again, uh, and he doesn't want that uh, value. But really, Peter was looking for something to answer the uh, big threats that were coming on the board. Something that will either give, give him value if someone board wipes, or uh, something that will let him stop a board wipe from happening. So that's what Peter was hoping to get out of this. He then heads to combat and swings a Draugr Necromancer at Griffin and Yorn at Caleb. All of his snow permanents will untap and Griffin blocks with a bird token and Caleb has no blocks. Caleb takes the damage and goes down to 1. He then pays 6 mana for a blood on the snow, destroying all creatures. The second half of the blood on the snow will not return anything to the battlefield per the weathered runestone. The Draugr Necromancer will trigger Exiling Kolvari, Toroth, Icehide Troll, and Augury Raven. Peter then pays 2 mana to foretell a card from his hand and then passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He pays 4 mana for a Glorious Protector and declines to exile any creatures with its ability. He pays 3 mana for an Inga Runize, which when it ETBs, he is going to scry the top two cards of his library. He puts one on top and the other will go on the bottom. He then passes his turn and all rend will trigger and he names Sorcery, getting a Doom Scar to his hand and the other goes on the bottom. There it is. Uh, <laughs> I can't, there is no escape. Griffin begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring. He draws and pays 9 mana to recast Vega. Oh my gosh, this hurts to watch. He's cast Vega for the fourth time. He then pays two a mana to equip the Sword of the Realms to the bird and pays two mana to cast a Beskir Shieldmate. He then passes and in his end step, Peter pays two mana to cast a Behold the Multiverse from Fortel, scrying two to the bottom and drawing two cards. Peter then pays two mana for Raise the Draugr, returning Draugr Necromancer from his graveyard to his hand. With no further actions, Peter begins his turn. He untaps and draws. Peter then pays 4 more mana for the sorcery crippling fear naming squirrels, which means all creatures that are not squirrels are going to be getting minus 3, minus 3 until the end of turn. This will kill Caleb's Inga and the Beskir Shieldmate and Vega. Caleb will draw 3 cards from Inga dying. The Beskir Shieldmate will make a warrior and Griffin will return Vega to his hand per the Sword of the Realm's ability. At least he doesn't have to pay that commander tax again. <laughs> Peter then pays 5 mana for a Narfi, and then pays 3 more mana for a Varagoth, the Blood Sky Sire. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps, and in his upkeep gets a 4th counter on his Replicating Ring, and then he draws his card for turn. He then pays 3 mana for a Poison the Cup, destroying Griffin's Warrior. He heads to combat and swings everything at Griffin for a total of 12 damage. Griffin responds by tapping out for a Graven Lore, scribing 5 cards from the top of his library to the bottom and drawing 3 not finding anything and takes the damage and is out of the game. Rip in peace, Griffin. Rip in peace, Griffin. What a whirlwind. Yeah. Did, you know, he, he won the last game. He he had a lot of value. He had a lot of mana. He had a lot of things going for him. He couldn't keep his commander around for the life of him. I think he only got two cards off of Vega that entire game. And they were both in one turn. Yeah. So he's... <laughs> He he was mostly just going like the combat damage strategy, as as far as we could tell, to try to fly over everyone just like he did in the last game, and he just wasn't getting the value that he needed to to continue to interact with the board and and take care of the threats. So, in the end, the board wipes got him, and and yeah, rip in peace. Rip in peace. With Griffin now dead, Caleb then pays 5 mana for a Doom Scar and destroys all creatures. He then goes to his end step and all runs will trigger and he names creatures and he gets Emerson Predator from the top of his library into his hand and the other goes on the bottom of his library. And then Caleb heads to discard, discarding some cards and with no further actions, Peter begins his turn. Peter untaps and draws his card for turn. He pays 2 mana for a Priest of the Haunted Edge and pays 4 mana for a Battle Mammoth from Fortel. 
He then pays two mana to foretell a card and passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then he draws a card. He then heads to combat and swings Allerant at Peter for a total of 9 damage and Peter blocks it with the Priest of the Haunted Edge which will go to the graveyard. He then pays 4 mana for a Binding of the Old Gods. Peter pays 2 mana to cast a Sot coming and counters the Binding of the Old Gods. Caleb then pays 3 mana for a Cosima and then passes and in his end step all run triggers choosing instants and gets nothing off the top of his library. Peter untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He then pays 5 mana for a Carfell Kennel Master to give the Battle Mammoth plus 1 plus 0 and indestructible until the end of turn. He then pays 4 mana to equip the Draugr's Helm onto the Battle Mammoth giving it Menace and goes to combat swinging a 9-7 Battle Mammoth with Trample, Menace and indestructible. Unable to block this unit of a creature, Caleb is taken out going down to zero life. Rip in peace, Caleb. I feel like Caleb was doing the best out of all of us in this game. He was getting a lot of value, especially in the early game from his Haka. He cast three board wipes that game, and he he was getting a ton of value, a ton of creatures. He was putting stuff out every turn. He was a threat on the board the entire game. And yeah, I think he just fell to that same fate of not having the evasion to to block the creatures that were coming at him yeah i honestly thought when caleb took all that damage from griffin you know going down to six i really kind of counted caleb out of this game i didn't really see a way of him clawing back and he was able to take griffin back out on the swing back so I, it was very impressive of him for not giving up when things seemed really bad so and with everybody else dead at the table and by process of elimination that means peter is the winner yeah somehow um <laughs> <laughs> congratulations uh, well, to peter on this victory thank you thank you i am happy with my deck i feel like i i, I played it a bunch outside of this just my duel of the peaks build i had a lot of fun playing yorn with just normal commander decks the, the value that yorn gives with all of the snow mana is crazy and all of the little cantrips that you can do with like the pilfering hawk and frost auger and everything else things that that pump up multiple times huge impact on the game if you are playing yorn so i had a lot of fun playing this deck and i'm happy to to, uh, to snag the win there so here in the close my post game thoughts particularly about my deck and about how this game went i honestly i only having two colors in this one limited card pool with just this one set means i don't have as much access to as many different cards different different utility spells, you know, different types of effects that Caleb and Peter were able to have. So I really felt like my deck was already at a pretty big disadvantage coming into this game. But honestly, I did have a lot of fun. I was able to play a bunch of angels, which from this set, a lot of the angels were really cool. Just unfortunate that the second game I wasn't able to get much going. I kept kind of a really slow hand and was severely punished by the board wipes. Didn't have a lot of ways of refilling my hand. Did I even cast my commander? You did not. You didn't cast your commander that entire game. Yeah, and I, I wasn't even able to get my commander out. Probably wouldn't have done much anyways with like how many board types are flopping around, but I'm very excited for Time Spell Remastered and all the cards it's bringing to our, our meta. So I agree. I think that more versatility, more variety in the cards that we can play will make for more interesting commander games. I'm really excited to add the time spiral cards because there are a lot of great cards in there. Lots of staples that we see in normal EDH games. And so it's, we're still limited in the number of commanders that we can play. And there aren't, there still aren't a lot of options for what we can do, but at least the gameplay will be a little bit varied and maybe we'll see some combos. Maybe it'll be a little bit faster paced. So I agree. Uh, th this game and both of these call time games were very slow. We're very slow, very hard to get through. And they were fun. It was fun to build the decks, fun to challenge ourselves in this way. But I think really the the format suffers a bit by having that much of a limited card pool, at least in in Commander. And I know that a lot of people were saying, "Oh, this is just Brawl. This is basically we're we're playing Brawl, except with a hundred card deck." And that's essentially true. We we have an even more limited card pool than Brawl, which is saying something. And that's not necessarily something that I would recommend for all games and all games of Commander. 
but it is a fun little experiment that we're trying and i'm excited to see how this progresses through the year especially including the non-standard sets there's something different than what we'll see in in brawl so oh yeah i think by like modern horizons our it's going to be like unrecognizable like it's I, i'm really excited to see what we can do with this so absolutely let's go to griffin and caleb they have some post-game thoughts to share and then we will come back and do our play of the game hello again my goats here's griffin post analysis this was a super fun game of course there was a ton of board wipes so many times it was really hard to keep creatures onto the board but as you know the plan of the deck was to use starnheim unleashed to get so many flyers on that my opponents couldn't take care of them but with the board wipes i just couldn't pull through Overall, though, it was an incredibly fun game. Everybody got to do their thing, and at those last final turns, it was hard to know who was going to win. So congrats, Peter, for your win. You definitely deserved it. Hey guys, Caleb again. I really enjoyed getting a ton of value out of Haka and Allrun pretty much the entire game, especially after making Allrun indestructible. That was pretty fantastic. And getting Tybalt was pretty sweet as well. I really love playing Tybalt, except for the fact that he's almost always immediately killed or dealt with so it was fun to see him sad to see him go so quickly it was a really long game for us and i still struggled playing over discord a little bit which resulted in me making some really big mistakes towards the end of the game that cost me the game but that's how you learn the biggest oof that wasn't a mistake for me was getting my stolen doomscar countered I think that that could have really changed the game for me, but all in all, it was a really fun deck. I'm glad to maybe finally move away from playing five colors, and I had a ton of fun. All right, thank you, Griffin and Caleb. Let's move into our play of the game, and after discussing a little bit, we have decided that Griffin's extra turn turn was amazing. We First, you see you know, his replicating ring is at seven. It's about to go off. It's about to make extra rings. And people are holding interactions in, in their hands, but they're not, like, ready to deal with this. And Griffin casts that All Runs Epiphany, and, you know, that that totally seals the deal for him to get a ton of extra mana on his next turn. So, And then he starts to target Caleb. Tries to take him out of the game. He falls a little bit short, but that Kaya's Onslaught in his second turn did so much work getting him close. And Caleb only ended up with six life at the end, you know, trying to get rid of the person that's outvaluing the board. So he he did a lot of work there. And then to top it all off, he paid 15 mana into a Starnheim Unleash and got seven 4-4 Angels insane value from this one all runs epiphany that should have set him far ahead if there weren't so many board wipes in the game so i i really applaud him for for such masterful play mm -hmm. in, in the game i'm definitely in agreement. i think that that was the play of the game and for me the mvp card of the game has to go to caleb's all runs god of the cosmos and the haka whispering raven that card gave him so much value throughout the game and kept his hand full and all run was a massive beater and when he put that indestructible counter on it so it survived all of those board wipes that was just honestly just i think that card did more work than any other single card throughout the game the value that he got just from having haka at the beginning of the game you know a, a, a one in a blue bird that can fly in basically undetected get him some scry triggers get him some card selection early in the game that's even having us consider if we should put this in our own blue decks our mono blue decks or or other uh decks that we play normally just to get that card advantage Definitely. really powerful card. super powerful card yep so the total wins so far for this season are griffin and peter are tied at one win total we're pulling ahead landon what are you gonna do win <laughs> i don't know <laughs> what do you want me to do <laughs> all right uh next episode Next episode, we are going to start playing with Time Spiral Remastered cards. All of us have already built our decks. We are ready to play. We're actually playing later this afternoon when we're recording this. And we've all changed our commanders. We're, it, it's going to be an entirely different game. And uh, we hope to see that come up in the next couple of weeks, if all goes well. So we look forward to seeing you there. And that's it for this episode of Duel of the Peaks. Thank you again for tuning in to Duel of the Peaks. If you want to support us, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley. Sign up today. 
you get to watch some of our gameplays that we do over Discord. You get to play with us on a regular basis. And we are sending out merch. We're sending out signed cards, all sorts of things. We interact a lot, especially during the Strixhaven spoiler season. It's a lot of fun to be on that Discord. So make sure to check it out and see if it's right for you. And if you guys are interested in any of the cards that you saw featured in our gameplay or interested in purchasing any of these decks for some reason, if you're a weirdo, you can do so by using our affiliate link in the description of this video to purchase them from GameGrid. It helps out the channel a lot and you can get these cards that you saw in the video. So that's a great way of supporting the channel. We'd really appreciate it if you guys considered that. Be sure to stay tuned for more deck techs. We're releasing Time Spiral Remastered deck techs right now and soon we'll be releasing Strixhaven deck techs. We're really excited for Strixhaven and all all the things that we have seen so far have just made us even more excited. So stay tuned for all of that. Check out our social medias for more information. And thank you again for watching. We hope to see you next time. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Take care. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Peter. Should have been me. <laughs> I had a doom scar. Oh man, that would have been perfect. Another hour, moment, but another eight turns <laughs> later. Yeah, yeah, okay. we would have gotten to turn eighteen again.